Hello everyone, this is Manoj Tandon, your host. Welcome to another episode of Dark Rhino Security, Security Confidential. Today we have an awesome guest joining us. He is Ben Johnson. Ben is a serial entrepreneur. He's got a long track record of success and a ton of hands-on open source programming experience. He's 20 plus years as a software developer and leader. Uh, ben is the CEO and founder of Particle 41 a deaf uh, firm founded by industry veterans that aims to help companies accelerate their initiatives through software development, DevOps, and data science. And I'm really, I took a pause there because that name Particle 41 is really interesting. I I, I want to know that. In fact, welcome to the show, Ben. Thank yes. you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Yeah, Manoj, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be talking to a security professional such as yourselves. Oh, uh, I don't know if we'd go so far as saying as we're professionals, but sure, we're in the security, <laughs> we're in the security space. But I got to tell you, uh, <clears throat> Particle 41, I, I have to ask about this. What, with a name like that, what? where did that come from? <laughs> sure, no problem. So um, I, I was reading a Daniel Suarez book, and in the opening chapter, uh, there's a lab uh, Lab 41 that creates anti-gravity, right? So uh, oh. a little bit of a sci-fi novel. Uh, but then I started looking into, okay, this um, this idea of, uh, you know, something accompanied by a number. We started looking at the periodic table. And the 41st element is an element called niobium. Okay. And in the metallurgical process, niobium, niobium is added to steel and it makes steel stronger. It gives it a little bit of a flexibility. And uh, it also gives it a sheen. So you can anodize niobium and make it blue. You can, uh, depending on how you anodize it. So in that uh, kind of foundry process, we found this usefulness of you adding small amounts of niobium to your, uh, to your, to your craft there makes it more flexible, uh, maybe look a little better, stronger. And so we like this idea of adding particle 41 to your business made you stronger and more flexible. And so... Uh, we kind of gravitated towards that concept and have created a brand from that. That that's uh, very cool, and and I and of course the domain name had to be available as well. <laughs> of course, of course, yeah. All those squatters out there, you got to get, you got to be original. Uh, you do. I, um, you know, I've done five companies myself, Ben, and I, I kid you not, one of the things we've thought of so many cool names, but a lot of times the domain <laughs> is not available. As silly as that sounds. Sure. But, right. But uh, give us a little, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. You know, you, you've, you've CEO now, you've been a leader and you've, you've actually been a developer too. So what, what's your journey? Yeah. So uh, typically I work with, or in my past, I've worked with early stage companies. Um, I built an online travel company right out of college called One Travel. Brand is still around today. Yeah, so then I started a travel marketing company uh, called Travel Ad Network. Uh, was one of the first vertical ad networks. So think of uh, all these travel guide publishers and travel advertisers. We created the technology platform for there to for the travel uh, bloggers to create or to monetize their content through uh, well targeted ads. Um, so I was in the online advertising dark art for a while. Uh, I did a similar type of company in finance. Um, and then most recently I did a legal services startup and sold it to legal zoom. Um, wow. and so I've been industry wise, I've been a little bit all over the place, but what emerged from that was one, my relationship with an Indian national gentleman named SD. So we are partners in the business. He's in India. I'm here. Um, yeah. and he and I have been working together for 20 years. Um, I've since partnered with two other CTO types. And so our business is run by industry veterans. What it really means is we're four CTOs that have run Fortune 5000 um, businesses or had successful exits. And um, we I started Particle 41 in 2012, really out of a desire to create the kind of teams that I like to work with as a CTO or technical co-founder. I wanted to start to create those kinds of teams. And of course, my network kept uh, calling me up and saying, hey, can I have one of those teams? Yeah. And so um, it did kind of fall into place. 
Uh, and then over the years, we've diversified into the DevOps, software engineering, and data science as our three core service areas. Oh, very cool. Uh, very uh, interesting story there. I, I got to ask you, in your ideas, when you started the travel firm or legal firm uh, online, where what was the origin of your ideas? Where did they come? What's your inspiration? What drove you? Yeah. That's a great question. I don't think I can take credit for the ideas. Normally, when I, when you're a technical co-founder, and I certainly am, I like to be a running back behind a really good blocker um, or uh, the running back paired with a really good QB. Uh, so f- football analogy, American football analogy here. But the, um, uh, the legal services startup, I actually joined that on a bet because my uh, the, the other founder... Uh, said if I went and checked Particle 41 LLC with the state of Texas, it wouldn't be in good standing because uh, most people in their first couple of years of business, they don't do their annual reports or the necessary secretary of state things. And so the state puts you on in a in a uh, kind of a default status. OK. And so sure enough, I went and checked online. I was in default status and I called him back. He said, see, this is the opportunity we have. Uh, to make sure that people stay in good standing with the Secretary of State. And sure enough, uh, that turned out to be a really good uh, venture and idea. Uh, so we really like to give the ideas of our clients, you know, a fuel and and really embrace their ideas and let them provide the direction while we manage uh, the execution of the solution. Wow. Oh, okay. That that's That's very, very cool. But that also puts there's a heavy responsibility on you because the execution is equally critical. It's one thing to have a good idea, but if the execution is poor, then you're not going to have much success out there. And and you're doing core dev. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you know that's really our privilege um, to be under the pressure to execute well. And so uh, we're happy to do that. That's what we want. I, I've always I always say. Uh, you know, we love to crush the mountains of work. So if we can get all that work organized into a backlog somewhere and just go after it, that's where we do our best. In fact, my teams are the healthiest when they are overloaded with work. Really? Um, and so that, that's really the part we like. So there's a innate sense of urgency on all of them to get it done, get it done well. Yeah, our core values are visibility and velocity. Those are those are our first two. Vision okay. is our third, but velocity and uh, visibility are kind of baked into the way we execute our service, and um, very important to all of us. Uh, you know, an internal mantra is make every day count, and and we feel like if we do that in the software development process, then we gain the result of those. Um, three things, the visibility, velocity, and vision, we get dependability. And that's what we really want to be perceived as the most as a dependable partner. And that brings us to uh, a question here. Um, One of the things with outsourcing DevOps, and I'm going to speak from my own personal experience, is often if you're able to black box it and make the specification really tight, then it can work if you have well-defined inputs and outputs. But if you're having them take an outsourced party, take the creative element of what it should look like, we've had struggles with that in the past. Now, maybe it's a cultural thing with overseas and how overseas cultures work. Um, But it seems like you might have had this thing figured out. So where do companies go wrong? You know, what are some myths here? in DevOps that, that we believe, just like what I described, that are not true. Sure. Yeah. So um, I think one of the misconceptions about DevOps is that DevOps is solely about tools. Um, I think that's a fundamental incorrect thinking. Uh, okay. Tools are, are a big part of DevOps, but they're not, um, they're not the end all be all. Really, DevOps is a methodology. It's about communication. It's about breaking down silos. It's not just about um, about the tools. And inevitably, in every DevOps conversation, there's this uh, big tools discussion. I think a couple of really uh, helpful um, players in the space have put this this kind of like periodic table of elements together where 
uh, the all of the different options for version control, for example, were in a row, you know, in a column down this periodic table. And so, sure, there are a ton of tools, um, but I think it's more about the process and the communication, and um, and this idea of continuous improvement and being part of that, and and having the DevOps teammates come alongside the developers and help them focus on their features. Uh, but then while they're focused on uh, feature development and velocity, they need to make their needs visible to the rest of the team. And, um, and then we'll always have this healthy discussion about, is it the platform? Is it the code? And how can we work together to improve both simultaneously? When you started this discussion, you said you wanted to build teams that you wanted to work with. I'm paraphrasing, but that that's, that's the gist of it. What makes a great DevOps team? Are there certain characteristics of the participants? Um, I think, uh, you know, a great DevOps team is one that's really focused on continuous improvement. Um, the, the idea of, of blamelessness is something that I think makes a really good DevOps team. That doesn't necessarily come from uh, the, the team themselves, but when um, and so I'll I'll explain blamelessness just a little bit and and I'll use um, I'll use a medical uh, metaphor here. In uh, used to be uh, in medicine, you'd go to the medicine cabinet in the ER, and something that would help you would be right next to something that could kill you. And both things started with the letter A because it was in alphabetical order. And, um, and so then, you know, you're in the, the, the heat of an emergency and a ER nurse grabs the wrong one and then doses the patient with the wrong thing. And there's a horrible, fatal, tragic uh, complication in the emergency room. Well, pretty, the, the issue with blame is that if you said, hey, uh, ER nurse, you did the wrong thing. It's all your fault. And even if they said, yeah, I grabbed the wrong one. I dosed them. That's the root cause. Uh, we now know what happened and, and I'm to blame. Unfortunately, that person would be in, could put potentially be in some really serious yeah. legal issue, yeah. uh, you know, life ruined over a simple mistake. And so blamelessness is the idea of saying, okay, uh, at least we know how this happened, but what, ha what, actually happened or the the way to actually improve is to say man the system really set that person up for failure by putting those two medicines right next to each other as a, a mistake could have occurred and so we need to now separate these medicines we need to think of a different framework other than alphabetical order we need to change this environment so that someone can't make this critical mistake so the the question in it would be if somebody came in and tapped on the keyboard and down the system, production is crashed and it takes a few um, hours to get back up. And um, and then there's a postmortem discussion. And uh, Jimmy, he says, I, I made a mistake. Well, what if that happened again? Jimmy made that a second time or Jimmy made that a third time. Eventually, Jimmy's going to get fired. Right. The organization has done nothing except lose somebody who is willing to make changes. And, and somebody who probably had the expertise to make those changes. And so the idea of blamelessness is saying, okay, even if we have human error, we're going to pull blame out of the situation. We're going to look for, okay, shouldn't we be responsible for putting Jimmy in that situation three, four times? And uh, we need to make some changes to the system. So I think a general understanding of that the DevOps folks are not there to flip switches and uh, keep the system alive through, you know, a system style defibrillator, you know, continue to shock yeah. the system to make sure that it stays up and running. But they're really there to make sure that the platform is supporting change and that that change can be can be done safely and quickly. And so DevOps teams are measured on how fast they recover from incidents um, uh, and uh, you know, how well they work together with the dev team and, and keep everybody uh, kind of in line and, and not blaming each other. And we look for those root causes and those improvements. You know uh, what you described there is, 
even a, a, a great approach to leadership, Ben. Now, if you can, that the, the approach of blamelessness, I can see it having a lot of merit and value in accelerating continuous improvement and enabling open dialogues in teams in very difficult situations. Maybe reduce the CYA factor a little bit. Yeah, perhaps. I do think that regardless, uh, humans need to be, I'm a big ownership person. Just ownership is, you know, do you own it? Then you own it. And, um, and so, you know, extreme ownership is important to me. And so uh, the humans involved, while they can't be blamed for something going wrong, because normally when something goes wrong, it's a bunch of different factors coming together. It's not just one thing, right? So we extract that, but then we put in this amount of responsibility. Like you guys are responsible for executing the continuous improvement. So we are universally responsible or, or maybe even we individually own something that doesn't go away just because we took blame, uh, you know, just because we imp implemented a blameless culture. We, we just said that we wouldn't stop with Jimmy did something and it broke the system. Uh, we would continue to find out how can we be responsible as a team and as individuals to, uh, you know, to carry through and make it better. So, um, you know, it is uh, it is a fact as a leader that you also have to tell people when they are performing below expectations. Yeah, sure. And so blamelessness is not a, a, a culture that takes that out, you know, uh, takes away responsibility. You just mentioned extreme ownership. Please dive into that a little bit. You, you believe. Sure. In yeah. I feel I feel like extreme ownership is a little bit cliche. Um, uh, I'm a fan of Jocko Wilnick and uh, my team has heard me talk about this stuff so much. They roll their eyes at me. Now. Um, but, uh, but well, extreme I hope ownership... they listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, extreme ownership is just this idea of, um, really taking responsibility for, uh, what is put under your control. So the way I like to explain it is imagine that you're frustrated with your boss. You're like, man, you know, I'm just, I'm in this bad situation and it's all my boss's fault. If you just took for a minute and said, well, what if you were your boss, what would you tell your boss to do? Or what if you were your boss's boss, what would you tell your boss to do? And then think about that for a minute, because a lot of us just have, we have a funk with authority, right? Like we have this authority, they're asking us to do stuff. We're not necessarily bought in on, um, but if you just took a minute to think, what would you want your boss to do? So if it's, I'd, I really want them to hire an additional person on my team because then I could meet my goals. Why don't you go tell them that? Because in many cases, we're kind of over here slogging away and we're not actually taking ownership of our area. We're just looking for who to blame. Oh, it's not me. It's them. It's a very natural thing. And uh, so taking a minute to say, okay, what, what could the company do for me to help me? What are my needs? And then going and telling your boss, like, hey, this is what I need from you. Many times you realize that what you want your boss to do, you could actually do yourself. You could provide more strategy. You could manage up and say, this is really the plan I think we should, should do. These types of tasks can't be left alone. They're being ignored right now. Those are things that... You might want your boss to own, but you, in fact, own that. And probably they're expecting you to own that as well. So that's what I think of extreme ownership is don't limit yourself to a role, but think what you want the role above you to do and then see if you can do that or you can ask them and tell them that you need them to do that. When you instantiate this on a team, do you get any pushback from from people? Oh. Um. I do, but normally that pushback is rolled up in a capability issue. Like folks don't have a framework. Uh, they don't have a way of thinking about what they need. The problem is too abstract. And so that's, that's usually not necessarily a, a, an ownership problem, but some training is needed or something. And so um, the pushback usually comes from trying to figure out how to make those tasks seem easier. Okay. And getting back um to the devops process yeah. you had mentioned that 
having those bridge type people is people are, are organizations are lucky if they have those. If they don't, are you are you guys at Particle Forty One providing them as part of your development cycle and embedding them into the client's org? With some of these absolutely, uh, absolutely. So since we get to see multiple engagements, I mean, if you're an enterprise and you decide to do a container, you know, an app modernization, and you want containers, you're going to roll out Kubernetes and you're going to roll it out once. We've rolled it out fifteen times. So. Um, so by working with us, we have reference architectures and we can kind of show reference architectures to the stakeholders and the technical folks at a client and say, hey, here's our, uh, we call our Kubernetes, our, our, our main kind of flagship uh, container architecture, we call it Titanium. And then we have a lighter weight one that's probably more appropriate for a startup or smaller app. And we call that Aluminum. And so we bring these uh, we bring these reference architectures with us and say, hey, here's a starting place. Can we get started on this? And most of the time, yes, um, but we need a different type of database or we have these other things that we're thinking about as application dependencies. And so then we incorporate those very easy for us to add, uh, add those those nuances. But we at least start with a great best practice. And that's the wonderful thing about DevOps is you have people all over the world trying to get better and better at this cloud stuff. And so we can bring those best practices with us. And that usually closes the gap really quickly. So uh, let me ask you, uh, in your opinion, you've done so many app devs. I, it's probably uncountable. Is there a benefit to being first to market with a concept? Or one um, that was just your experience showing you. I'm sure you've run into this. Sure. I think it is. Um, I think the best market example is like Uber versus Lyft, right? So you yep. have Lyft as the second comer. Uber really pioneered the whole idea of the two-sided marketplace in transportation. Um, if you're Lyft, are you disappointed about uh, competing there? I, I don't think you are. I think um, you also got that benefit of that pioneer, right, to, to kind of burst through. So I think depending on your idea, you kind of have to decide which one you are. Ch chances are, if you are first, there's going to be somebody right on your tail. Um, and, and so uh, I think you can do the you can be the second comer and kind of follow along. Um, but you also understand the size of the market. Like you'll, you'll probably always be a split of the market share rather than the market share itself. Which monetization and that that's a whole topic in itself, but I, I'm curious since you've worked with open source, how do you monetize? Give us some strategies. Uh, how do you monetize open source? Um, so there are a bunch of different patterns that we've seen. So we have seen dual licensing, you know, pretty often yep. where, um, you know, you can use it for free, but you don't get support. You want support or a commercial license. Um, so we've seen that some are, uh, you know, some make a lot of sense and, uh, some don't Right, the, the dual licensing, like. Uh, the one I don't like is, well, I want to use this for real customers rather than some kind of dev project. And that always seems kind of vague to me. Um, but uh, most enterprises need to have support in order for them to maintain their compliance rules. So they will, uh, they'll go ahead and upgrade to the, the commercial license just um, out of a, out of a, a safety measure or a safe passage. Um, and so certainly we see that support and maintenance come in as a, a monetization strategy. Uh, you also see consulting and customization um, where you're not necessarily charged for the product itself, but the services around it. Yep. Um, of course, you know, your big uh, uh, NetSuite, Salesforce, those kinds of things have a whole consulting ecosystem associated with them. Um, and, and so this, you know, AWS, you know, becoming a, an Amazon preferred partner is, uh, is something that you seek after so that you can help uh, help with the adoption and charge for your service. Uh, there's also like premium features and add-ons. 
Um, so maybe a, a particular part of the open source project that moves you into a paid, uh, paid strategy. Um, and then you'd also see like hosting, like once you want it, to, if you want it to be hosted on our cloud, uh, MongoDB is a great example of this. I really like their uh, Mongo Atlas product and it's okay. kind of a managed cloud installation of the MongoDB database. And it kind of answers that idea of being a managed service. It is a managed service and managed, managed by Mongo themselves. And then you just use a VC, VPC peering to get access to it in your AWS environment. So that, I think that's a great um, success story of, you know, using the, the hosting and support um, of that. Another great example is WordPress is a free open source tool. Yep. But Atomic is like the, the the product side. And so it's a non-for-profit entity paired with a for-profit entity. Um, and I don't think you'll hear any complaints for them on how they've structured that. Um, so these are some ideas with how to you know monetize open source. No, that, uh, you know, in the cybersecurity industry, we have a lot of open source tools uh, that are available. And this that... I wanted our audience to hear it from someone who's been in this business as to how someone's got to make money on this somewhere. Otherwise they can't keep developing. You can't just be all free all the time. Yeah. But the beauty of the open source is the collaboration. And when the idea is young, you're getting a bunch of free feedback. You're getting almost like free specification <laughs> uh, to, to fill the thing out with features. And um, I think that early stage community building can be totally valuable. I just, you know, yeah. in, in a past life, I was in the aircraft industry and I saw the general aviation industry got killed off uh, because attorneys sued them into oblivion. Sure. It, it, it had a horrible ending in many respects. And now it's come back, but it's no longer true that an average American can go buy an airplane. And that used to be true. There was a time and it was true. Uh, and it has to do with liability and it has to do with uh, legal teams seeing an opportunity to mine for gold. <laughs> yeah. And that's the only work. thing that worries me. It will work. I mean, um, you know, if, if you were traveling 10 years ago and you wanted to get something healthy to eat in an airport, you were just out of luck. Yeah. You know, they, you had donuts and pizza. Those were your options. Um, now you go to the airport that, you know, if you're in a good airport, um, you know, most airports will have a healthy restaurant in there. And certainly if you go into the convenience stores, there's at least some healthy snacks. Yeah. Um, and that happened uh, like overnight, like just. One one week we were traveling, there was no uh, no healthy options, and then it just seemed like bam. Now you can get a healthy snack at an airport, and that has to be from consumer demand. So I, I say educate consumers, and then they will decide. As as a general, you know, regulations tend tend to not age well. Last question: um, You've been very generous with your time here, uh, Entre entrepreneurs who are successful and those who are not so much so get you've you've been down this road many a times give us uh characteristics you think that make one successful and maybe not so much on the other side what's your experience Sean? um yeah i mean i think you have to be goal driven um from my perspective and what we do right sizing the solution is a core skill. So we've worked with partners uh, that how they think of what they're going, the sequence, the sequencing in which what they're going to release to market. So Forte is a really um, one of my uh, favorite uh, customers. Forte is, um, they just entered the market. They went live a few months back. We help them build an, an in-lesson experience for music tutors, music teachers. And so it's a one-on-one -on -one music lesson. So we needed to build a better than Zoom uh, video conferencing for this uh, music lesson to, to take place. And so we, we wanted to amp up all of the sound quality features of, a, of an online uh, video conference. 
And then we wanted to take away, like have the thinnest bezel possible, like take away all the other features, just have student and teacher working together with a sheet of music. Um, and then we even incorporated the phone so that you could have this other view of the hands. And we really tailored this experience for a music lesson. And they could have gotten, uh, you know, when we started this project a few years back, they could have said, and scheduling and billing and really tried to go live with the full marketplace. But instead they smartly went live with um, the in-lesson experience brought in teachers. Now they have those things, you know, now time has allowed them to do the billing and scheduling and um, start to go to market as the two-sided marketplace. But what I really like about those guys is how they sequenced. They were able to get users very quickly. I think uh, within our first 30, 90 days, we were testing with users of, wow. of being engaged with them because they had such a great idea of, Hey, let's just do this piece first. And they sequenced their their build uh, in accordance with user demand, and they just did a really good job. Now, the dichotomy of that or the other side of that would be somebody who's looking at that next best competitor, and they're saying, that's what we want to be. Let's build all of those things. And so they're overloading features. They're way, their appetite for features is way beyond their budget. And if, if they're if the only way to, to go to market is to have what's on the horizon, then they will never go to market. And just because the appetite is bigger than the budget. And so to me, the, as a, as a entrepreneur, especially in the software game, you need to figure out a small thing, get user, get active with users, get live as quickly as possible and then listen to each user and, and essentially let them give you the specification, let them tell you what is important to them. Um, and, and so that is, I think that's make or break from what we've seen um, is, is the right appetite, the right amount of features, that understanding of an MVP. Those are key. Understanding of an MVP, understand your market, understand its need and right size for that. Right. And there you have it. That that's a, Great formula. <laughs> Especially now when capital is so expensive. Um, quite frankly, I'm not sure that we have a choice otherwise. Yeah. Um, but you can also think, go back to uh, 2000s, early 2000s, um, where there's all this bootstrapping content. We need to get back to that with, a, with the interest rate, what it is right now. I think that that concept of bootstrapping you think you have an idea, put an ebook out, you know, do something small to test the waters and learn more and start to build an audience. We have social media. We didn't have that in the early 2000s. Um, try your ideas out in social media, you know, see, also see if you can offer a service and then tech enable that service rather than thinking about a two-sided marketplace off the jump. So imagine, um, uh, you know, imagine Uber, you know, if initially they had gone live with somebody, you know, being a dispatcher to coordinate the rides. Yeah. Uh, right. They could have made revenue from the first day because they were doing a service for their customers. Now, um, this is a very bad example because, of course, everyone would view them as wildly successful. But what if success to you is to not have to go raise billions of dollars in capital? Um, it may just be that the two-sided marketplace needs to come later. Right now, you need to focus on the service, tech enabling the service, and then evolving to a two-sided marketplace over time. And that may just be the reality that we're in with such the with a high cost of capital. That's very good advice. Very, very good advice. We're down to the last minute here. We want to give you the floor to plug whatever you would like. Let our Audience, know what's on your mind and where you'll be appearing or anything. What's going on, Ben? What would you like them to know? Oh, sure. So um, we will be at the JFrog conference in September. Um, so the, they have a, a pretty cool concept called Swamp Up. Um, okay. I'm also going to be at the All In podcast that same week. Uh, the All In podcast. Some people will really will know that one. Um, if you want to reach out, you have um, maybe you want to. What we're doing right now is we're offering four advisory sessions with me um, for free, complimentary advisory sessions. If you have a an initiative, a software project, maybe 
uh, an app that you're feeling that maybe you need to modernize. Maybe you're even thinking about an acquisition and there's some kind of software asset involved. Um, I will run a, a, an advisory playbook with you, uh, four sessions, about 45 minutes each, completely complimentary. You can reach me at ben uh, at particle41.com or you can okay. find me on LinkedIn. And um, we're offering that uh, right now with any CEO or CTO that has an initiative that, uh, that they want some extra advice on. Fantastic. Well, Ben, thank you so much for taking your a precious hour with us here today. Uh, you've given us some sage advice and would, you know, as things change, if you ever want to come back, you're always welcome back. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for the kind words. And um, the questions were great. I really appreciate you, uh, uh, you know, pulling out some really, really cool topics. Oh, we try. <laughs> we try. Um, I'll give some credit to Emily as well on this. So. <laughs> awesome. Right. Great. Well, hey, take care, Ben. 